Ladies, gentlemen, and everyone outside the box, the Magnificents are in town. Buy your tickets, set your clocks. This is not your average clown. The tents are raised, the elements transpire. The sawdust is literally on fire. When the moon appears and the sun sets ember, you know but this. This will be a show to remember. So it's about performing circus stuff things out here. There we go. So what are we looking at here? We have on the main board, we have the victory point track around the outside, around the outside, around the outside. Then going from there, uh, inside we have a bunch of different areas. We have the travel area first off, broken down into the orange travel area, the green travel area, and the purple travel area. Up here we have the main tent. With the main tent, we have all of the dice, which are going to be the actions and the power of said actions that we're going to be taking on our turn. As you can see, there are four different colors. There are orange, there are green, and there are purple. In addition to that, there are clear dice. Now, full disclosure here, the clear dice that come with the game are actually clear dice. However, because we're streaming and because they don't show up very well, we actually substituted a darker color in here so that you guys can see them a little bit clearer, pun intended. So there we go. So we have our clear dice there. Then over on the bottom right hand area, we have the poster display for the different performers out here. We have the performance track, which is this track right here, which has to do with one of the available actions. We have trainer work or trainer areas for our trainers to be able to go on. And then over on the far left hand side, we have what's called the main display, which are going to be where the various, um, uh, excuse me, master cards and trainers and the supply for each will be. And up in the top left hand corner is a reminder, a handy dandy little reminder of what happens when you cannot pay for the power of your dice at the end of each round, i.e. don't do that. Now up above the board we have the three randomly generated trainers that you can see up there which we're going to be starting with at the, uh, when we get started uh, at the beginning of the game. Then we have four different colors of gems, as you can see, which match the color of the dice, which also match the color of the traveling areas. So we have orange, green, purple, and clear. That's pretty much everything that you guys can see off board. However, there are a plethora FA of different other things off board that we didn't want to clutter everything up with. We have the different colors of the pieces that we're going to be adding whenever we build. We have a small and a large red, and the same goes with green as well as for purple. Then in addition to that, we have all of our trainers, which are off board as well, as you can see there. But to be honest with you, Martin and I have a really bad habit of grabbing things that we shouldn't be grabbing yet. Wow, that sounds terrible. Let's try that again. <laughs> Martin and I have a really bad habit of grabbing extra pieces that we have not earned yet, so we actually have them in a central supply so that we do not do that. Then we have our own personal tableaus. Now, over here we have our main personal tableau, which these are symmetric. You'll notice that there is an A side here. We are playing the basic game here. On the flip side is a B side and there's a little bit of asymmetry to what it is that we start out with. So as you notice here, we start out with six money, but because Martin's here and I don't want to get made fun of, uh, we're actually using poker chips. So everybody will start with six, except for whoever the first player is actually has to give $1 to the last player. So hence why Martin will start with five and Greg will start with seven, or if we randomize turn order, you get the idea. Everybody also starts with one gem in their supply. You can hold a maximum of three each. Then over here in our main area, which is called the camp, the camp here is divided into nine different sections. As you can see, this is where we're going to be playing kind of a, a Tetris-y aspect with those various pieces that we're going to be building over there. Up above that, we have five different camps, I'm sorry, five different tent areas that we're going to be able to build. We have one that's printed on the board that every player starts out with. And there is one random beginner performance or performer 
uh, card that was randomly drafted for or randomly drawn for each of us as well. Over on the left hand side for the building action is a handy dandy little reminder chart for what you can build depending on the power of it. In game scoring chart down here in the left hand corner for all of these sections here. A quick reminder that these small pieces, what shapes those look like, the large pieces, what those look like, what we can do with the gems on a given turn, and then the available actions and the actual uh, turn round or a round summary, if you will, as well. Then everybody starts with a second performance marker because you may do a maximum possibly of a couple of performances in a round. Everybody starts with one trainer, as shown down here there, and everybody starts with four different master cards. These master cards are not credit cards, however, what they are is these are where we're going to be placing our dice out on, and they are divided into two sides. We have the immediate action and then a end of round, possibly end of game scoring section there. So that's everything that we are looking at, but now, how do you actually play the doggone game? Well, before we get to that, I figure I ought to talk about what it is that we're trying to do big picture wise. Well. The game takes place over three rounds, and each round has four turns. A turn is going to consist of taking a die and then using that die to do one of three actions. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But what we're going to be doing is we're going to be acquiring various building pieces to build up into our camps to possibly get some bonus materials, but all in the sake of getting victory points. And the main way we're going to get victory points in this game is doing performances predominantly, as well as some other little things here or there, and some end game scoring. But just know the majority of your scoring is going to be coming from these performances, as well as end of round and end of game scoring card or actions, end of game scoring abilities at the end of each round, all right? So as I said, the game takes place over three rounds. Each round has four turns. And within those four turns, you're going to essentially have three steps. The active player is going to take all of their action, their one action, then it will go clockwise in turn order, taking an action until all of us have taken four actions. So the first thing that's going to happen is you must take a die of the available dice pool. So when you take the die, you choose from there, let's say I choose, eh, let's say, this orange four. When I choose this die, I then must play, uh, choose one of the four available master cards to put this on and take the associated action. So if I were to place it on here, I immediately get a clear gem. Provided that I have room for a clear gem, then I would take a clear gem from the supply. If, however, I had three already here, in lieu of that, I must take one dollar instead. Pretty simple, handy dandy little reminder, plus, hey, if all those are full, I have to take a buck. Easy enough there. However, if I chose to go over onto this one, this says I can set the die to whatever value I want it to be. Okay, cool. I want to set it maybe to a five. Okay, done. So I have chosen the power, mostly, but I can boost this power in a couple of different ways. If I had chosen a purple die instead to go over here, this says when I place a purple die on here, I get a plus two, so this is actually an implied six as opposed to a four, as you can see on the card right there. The other thing that I can do is I can always boost the value of a die by two by spending one or more light colored gems. Now the clear gems are wilds. So what does that mean? That means in lieu of a purple, a green, or an orange, I can always spend a clear gem in which to be able to do whatever it is I'm trying to do. So in this case, I could turn this five by discarding this orange gem to a seven, and then I could actually spend a clear gem to make it a nine. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. Yeah. So I would discard those into the supply. I have now set the power of that die, which is actually a nine value die. And now I have a choice. There are three available actions that I can take on my turn. There is build, there is travel, 
and there is perform. So we'll do this in the ease of explaining this. So we'll start out with travel. I have a nine orange, remember, because I spent those gems. So the travel has to do with the travel section of the board. Now, it is an orange travel, so that means I get to take this orange travel caravan guy and move it nine clockwise. It's always clockwise. So, and I can always, it's always an up to, meaning one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And maybe I choose to stop there on the eight. The reason is you pick up anything and everything that you pass over except for these tents that are out here, these uh, white bordered tents out there. You must actually land on the space to be able to claim a tent. However, because I started here, I would actually get one, two, three orange gems, and then I would get one purple and one green in addition for all of that like so. So I would get this and I would add all of these onto my tableau. Easy enough? Yep. Provided that I had the space in which to do so, but you'll notice I do have the space because I spent the orange gem to boost that up to a nine, even though I only used it to an eight, etc., etc. I would place those down onto my tableau. Now, if previously somebody had already claimed this, this camp, I'm sorry, this tent marker, you'll notice that this here looks like a performance card, and you would be correct. So that means because I passed over that performance card, I can always choose one of the available performance cards face up, or as always, mystery meet there. So as it was, I would then take that camp tile, tent tile, I keep interchanging those terms, I apologize. I take this tent tile after, in addition to all the gems that I will have gotten like so, there, and then I have a decision to make. This tent now can go on any of the available tent spaces that I have on my board. Now this one's already printed there, so it's already taken, so I can't place it there. When you cover it, you immediately get whatever the bonus is that's shown. And notice at the top, it all shows a performance card. It's a little hard to see sometimes and easy to overlook. So I would get a performance card and whatever else I cover, two bucks, two clear gems, or if I didn't have room, money, an extra trainer from the supply, or four points. Easy enough, right? So maybe, let's say, I choose a couple of clear gems, I would get a couple of the clear gems, you get the idea, boom, done. And I have another tent out there. Any questions on the travel action? Nope. nope. All right. There is one other little uh, reminder out here or a little extra little bonus thing that you can do. I want to draw everyone's attention out here to the five training areas that are printed on the board. There is one for each of the available actions that say if you want, you can take a trainer out here and when you travel, you can actually go anti-clockwise or counterclockwise as opposed to always clockwise. So if you spend a trainer, you can then do so, okay? When we get to performing and building, I will talk what those actions provide you. And then these two, notice they don't have a symbol there in the middle. These allow you to immediately do whatever it is. Spend a trainer to flip to the flip side of that die. So I took a five, so I could flip it to a two, etc., etc. Or this one with a one plus. Now this one does not have a one plus, meaning you can only do this once and only once per turn. The trainer plus means for every trainer I choose to expend this way, I can do whatever the action is. This is pay two dollars to get a new performance card. So if I spend two bucks and one trainer, I get one. Four bucks and two trainers, I get two, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. So you'll notice that this one only allows us to do it once because obviously you can only go clockwise once. Makes sense. So that is the travel action. So moving on now to the second of the available actions, which is the build action. So using the same example, I spent some gems and boosted this up to a nine. So this is now a nine orange. So we now look over here to the build 
symbol over here and we look at the chart. A nine says I can get one large piece and one small piece Tetris wise to be able to place out here into my camp. The large pieces are as shown there and the small pieces are shown there. So as it is, it's an orange die, which means I must take, and I'll interchange red, red and orange, one of each piece like so. However, if I had spent at least one trainer, and possibly more, I can change the color of a piece that I am taking. So if I put a trainer out here, maybe I want the large green and the small orange. I can do that. If I were to spend two trainers, provided I have two trainers, I could actually change out the color for both of the pieces that I'm claiming there. Make sense? Good, all right. <laughs> so, in this case, maybe I just wanna go ahead and keep the red and we'll get there. A little foreshadowing for when we get to the performance. So now, it's a matter of where do we wanna place them. The first piece that you place can be placed anywhere out here in your camp. So maybe I just go dead middle and I say, I'm gonna put it right there. You immediately get whatever the bonus is that you cover, in this case, an extra trainer from the supply. And then from there, every piece must be orthogonally adjacent to at least one side of one piece that's out there. So maybe I do something along the lines of, say, cover these, I would get a clear gem and two bucks if I did something like that. Easy enough. And every time that I take this action over here, I'm going to get whatever pieces, unless I change the color of it here, and then place them out here. And obviously it has to fit within the window, et cetera, et cetera. So any, que any questions on the building action? Nope. Nope. All right, good, easy enough. So we'll actually leave that there for when we go into the third action that you can take on your turn, which is perform. If you are familiar with Trickerian, this is nothing like Trickerian. So, what is performing like? Well, first off, using the same example that we have here, and let's say I had boosted this to a nine value orange. We then look at the performance track out here, and you notice that these are numbered going from four all the way up to 20. Well, nine is eight, so I then would put my performance marker blocking off that space for everyone else for the rest of this round, and then I would take the associated actions, or performances as it were. You'll notice that there is a multiplier in the bottom left-hand corner here. That is how many performances I can actually perform on a single action. So in this case, because I went to eight, I could do two performances, provided that I have two performers two performances available to me. So what does that look like? Well, now I'm going to bring your attention to the card up here. These are the available performances. Depending on where it is, dictates whether or not it can be performed. No tent, no performance. Performance and a tent, hey, you can do that. If it were something along the lines of this, because of where I put it on the eight, I could do two performances as you see here, in theory but we'll get that we're getting a little ahead of ourselves. To be able to do a performance, you then look at whatever the prerequisite is here. It says, I need this piece to be able to do this Kimura performance. Do I have that? Yes. Boom, done, performance complete. So what do I get? I would get whatever that is, that is, and that is. So in this case, I would score one victory point and $4 from the bank, easy enough. Right? Then I would take this and kind of set it off to the side because there might be some sort of scoring for later on for this card. Now, because I'm allowed to do two performances, and let's say I had something along the lines of this as well, getting back to this. Because I'm doing two performances or wanting to do two performances in the same round, I must have each piece individually to be able to do each performance. So what does that mean? There is no doubling up of the same piece in the same performance. So if I wanted to do this and this, I would need two of the large orange pieces and a large green. So in other words, I could not do both of them. I could do, choose to do either this one or this one. This one will get me four points and five bucks. This one as aforementioned, however, if I had something along the lines of, say, this, 
Now I could do both of those performances. Does that make sense? Yes. So in that case, I would get one, five, I would get five points, four, and nine bucks. And then I would take both of these and kind of keep them over into my tableau. Does that make sense? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, there are other performances here that you'll notice may have gems on them with a slash through them. That means you must also discard that color gem to be able to do that performance in addition to whatever the other prerequisites that you must have. And as always, you can use clear gems to, to replace a colored gem, but you, it doesn't work the other way around, okay? And also, I should also point out that there are some camps, sorry, tents, that have specific colored gems that require you to discard. So this one is a purple gem. So if this were here, I would need to discard a purple, a green, and an orange gem, as well as have two pieces, and it could be that piece and that piece. They don't have to be adjacent or anything, to be able to perform this performance. So that would be 11 points and four bucks there. Any questions on performing? Okay, easy enough. And hold on, let's reset this a little bit. There we go. All right. So once you have taken a action, it becomes the next player's turn. And then when you take another action, you have to choose a different master card, so on and so forth. However, the thing that I also want to point out is the power boosting that happens in this game. When you choose a second die of the same color, this is no longer a five value die. This is now a 10 power action. They're cumulative of the same color. In addition to that, any quote unquote clear dice that you may take boost the value of whatever color that you want to take. So in this case, this could be a six purple, a nine green, or yes, a 16 orange. That makes sense? Yep. All mm -hmm. right. However, if I had placed that there and then on my last action I place this green, I then cannot use a clear die to then use it as a boost in a subsequent turn in that same round. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep. All right. All right. So now that you guys all understand all of that, let's go to the end of the round because after we have taken all four or all of the players have taken all of their actions, all four of their actions, there's now a series of round end things that are going to take place. First and foremost, payment. You have to pay for the power of your dice. So the easiest way to explain this is you pay for the highest pip value color. So as you can see, I have 10 orange and I have three green, which is higher, 10 orange. So I'm gonna pay 10 bucks. Then in addition to that, I'm going to pay whatever the clear dice total is as well. So as it is, I would pay a total of 16. If I had that, that would be 18. If it were something along the lines of this, that would be 6, 12, 14. I don't have to worry about that because the green is higher. That makes sense? Yep. I don't want to belabor that, but I just want to make sure it's clear. You pay the highest color plus the total of the clear dice. You pay that with the money that you have in hand. Any money that you cannot pay in the first round, for every dollar you're short, you lose a point. For every dollar you're short in the second round, you owe two points. Every dollar you're short in the third round, don't let this happen, three points. There you go. Then after that, we're going to then get new master cards and trainer tiles out here. So how does that work? Well, the order in which the performance is here, let's say it were something along the lines of that when we perform. Whoever has the highest performer value in this case, so if this were something like that, you would take the highest of your two that you may perform with here. So in that case, it would be something along the lines of that. Yellow would choose first, then red, then blue, meaning you choose both the master card and the associated trainer tile. So whatever one you choose, you then bring it over here and you add it into there. And in addition to that, 
you're going to add it into your tableau over here. Does that make sense? Yep. The reason we do that in this very specific order is because then at the end of your turn, you're then going must score one of the bottom of the five master cards that you now have, the four that you had during the round, and the fifth one that you just acquired. So you choose one of these to score, and you score whatever it is. Whatever the um, number of points multiplied by whatever it is over on the right-hand side to a maximum, possibly, of whatever it shows at the bottom. So in other words, if I had completed up to five of this symbol, as you can see right there. So for every one of these that I have completed, then I would score four points to a maximum of 20 points. Now I have five choices in which to be able to score one. I could score any of the four existing or the new one. If I score the new one, when I'm done scoring it, I just get rid of it, and I'm gonna have the same four available actions to me next turn. But maybe I scored this one instead, that one will replace it, and then in the next round, when these clear, I'll have those four actions to do instead. Easy enough? Yep. Mm -hmm. All right. Then after we have done that, we then prepare for the next round. What does that mean? That means we're going to take all of the dice, roll them, put them back into the main tent. Any of our trainers that we have used will then come back into our tableau. And then after that, I should also point out that these cards will immediately refill as well. So if you take multiple performances, you immediately refill and then choose which you do. We're going to refill new masters and trainers, and then rinse and repeat and do that three times. At the end of the game, which is at the end of the third round. Now keep in mind, we will have taken a fifth card at the end of the round, and then we're going to score one of our available master cards, just like what we did at the end of the first and second round. So let's say I choose to score this one full value based on what's down here. But then at the end of the game, we're then going to score every other card that you have left over, except the values are halved. And one thing that is not crystal clear in the rules, but the way we played it, we also have the maximum, meaning this would score two points for each of those that I've completed to a maximum of 10 points. And we do each one individually until we have scored all four at half value. Then after that, any money that we have left over converts to five bucks into one point. And then after that, the little symbol down here says for each completed area of the nine that you have out here, you will score four additional victory points. Now gems, are not worth anything at the end of the game. But if you're familiar with Feast for Odin, where you can use coins to fill in areas, much like that, you can then take any gems that you have left over to then cover up areas to complete those areas. So as it were, if it were something along the lines that worked out, looks like I planned it this way, like that, I have one, two, three completed areas for a total of 12 points, plus any points I've gotten there, plus any points I've accumulated throughout the game, whoever has the most points wins. The only thing that I kind of glossed over a little bit is, whenever you place trainers out here on your turn, at the end of your turn, they're going to come up here to the main tent, and they clear off at the end of your turn, including both the common ones, as well as any that are in your tableau. Those clear off each turn turn so that you aren't blocking either for yourself or for other players because they'll be up here. At the end of the round, you will be taking those trainers back, but not until the end of the round. And that, folks, is how you play the Magnificent.